As I have plunged back into reading Bill's writings, I'm struck by his early theological musings and their later minimizing. Why? Does it mean that the ground is not springboard for thinking religiously? Yet this is what he has set us up to do. When we get to where he was taking us, what are we called to do personally? Retrace his steps against modern dualism to the ground? Or start from this ground to think afresh? What then would a post-critical, personal, mind-body theology look like? After all too brief en en errantry into Bill's background, seem a longer posted paper, I will reflect on his achievement of the personal ground, accompanied by my flagrant questions, and begin to answer the call implicit in recovering the ground to think theologically. Hence my extension of Dale's title, what was Petit up to from the beginning, and what are we to do about it? When Bill studied at Yale Divinity, BD 1944, Niebuhr had already published The Meaning of Revelation 1941. No doubt, everyone who went to Yale in the 40s knew that book and studied with Niebuhr. He was a major draw. In this exploration of historical relativism, Bill would have encountered the following themes. Personal being, lived temporality, modernity's dualism that fragments and shatters confidence in religious language, bodily relatedness, and faith as trust in our being in the world, I've lost count. Exploring our inward depths. First person speaking. Imagination's use of metaphor, symbol, and dialogue. Awareness of divine reality in us. And, come on in, communal confirmation of personal religious talk. If you go back and read Meaning and Revelation and you look for those themes, they're there. Okay. Um, there's no way in which I can argue for influence because I don't know which of those things Bill would have noticed, but they une unequivocally are background. So when we get to his first written thing, the, di the dissertation was finished in 1950, though he got his degree in 51 on Pascal and Descartes. So the influence can, uh, while influence cannot be traced, Niebuhr is in Bill's background in recovering the ground Come in, have a seat. Bill acknowledges Niebuhr, who was, quote, most, was most congenial to my own investigations as we both were radically shifting away from the ground upon which dualism arose. Come on in. Bill's later themes, not explicit in Niebuhr, are the aural, visual, and speaking, written distinctions, and the same order, I'll come back to that word, the same order underlying rational scientific thinking and religious talk. While Bill develops the aural visual distinction in the dissertation through contexting Pascal and Descartes in relation to Renaissance art, these latter two themes do not appear until later. After the dissertation, Bill writes theology, especially in the 1950s. Well, he does make theological remarks from 1985 through his three books. He does not develop theological insights as he did earlier. Why? A clue appears comparing two essays in the incarnate word in the language of culture, 1954. Bill declares, I am doing theology. In 1974, persons and places, I, um, he makes a programmatic commitment henceforth to seek a post-Cartesian intellectual equilibrium. Think of the difference between I'm doing theology, I'm working on an intellectual equilibrium. In 54, Bill is doing exciting theology, exploring the meaning of incarnation with Niebuhr's 1951 Christ and Culture in the background. <clears throat> he says, the word Christ refers to our experience of reconciliation. Christ is not an object, but a new reality. I am no longer, I'm quoting, I'm no longer referring to a reality. I am in that reality. This is the real presence, as in the higher Christian traditions. Um, he quotes St. Paul, Christ lives in me. 
The logic of such intimate withinness in personal experience is that, the, quote, there is no separation between subject and object. Christ in me is not symbolic in the sense of pointing at something elsewhere. The symbol Christ, the symbol Christ brings us to a non-symbolic reality. Christ in me is an experience of the elusive eye which stands behind all language, yet which, is, which as active systematically eludes all language. Incarnation in 1954 for Bill is God's elusive eye participating in my elusive eye without separation of subject and object. That, quote, that making present of the living Christ in my own existence is the real thing. The incarnation itself, just right here within the very act of existing, which is myself. Uh, when I read this, I had not read these, this article before this past five months. I was uh, quite amazed and delighted. In 1974, Bill speaks no longer intimately of Christ indwelling him, but of a discarnate standing, he doesn't use the word discarnate, that's mine, standing before God, which, quote, deprives a man of his place in nature, in the city, in historical memory. He then makes his philosophical programmatic declaration. Bill is faithful in his later writings to his commitment to recover our personal mind bodily being by achieving a post-Cartesian intellectual equilibrium through exploring the tacit dimension. You're all familiar with this. The body's contribution in knowing and speaking, how words work and the logic of religious speech in the first person singular, the imagination, the dialogical, the distinction between spoken and written meaning, and reality understood through the Hebraic picture of speaking and hearing in contrast to modernity's Greek picture based on seeing and writing all over against Cartesian dualism. While he rejects distinguishing philosophy and theology, quote, this means that neither for Niebuhr nor for me is the distinction between philosophy and theology any longer a fruitful or even tenable one. Why does he turn from doing theology to primarily doing philosophy? In Polanyan Meditations, he does speak theologically of the oral, oral way Yahweh addresses Israel, melding theological and philosophical. Bill is saying something, I believe, more radical than distinguishing a Hebraic speaking being from a Greek static being. Reality is dynamically dialogical, exemplified by Yahweh as, quote, a metaphor for reality. Yahweh is a metaphor for reality page 129 in Polanyi Meditations. Continuing to affirm incarnation, he frequently quotes St. Paul's, God is that in which we live and move and have our being, and affirms, this is, this is an incredible statement, I experience myself as this mind bodily being concentered in my incarnate self before the I will be that I will be, even as Abraham, I dwell in my ground, in its ground, Yahweh's ground, where no dualism can gain purchase. Uh, page 122, 123 in Recovering the Ground. Why, however, so little theology as he seeks a post-Cartesian intellectual equilibrium? Now, I'm going to, if you'll indulge me, give you an anecdote of Poteet midwifing me into the logic of religious talk. In cassette tapes that Bill and I exchanged spring 1971 when he was off at Austin and I was at Duke in residence, uh, he commented on papers I had written for Harry Parton and Virgil Aldrich. Aldrich at Carolina, obviously. That connection between Duke and Carolina, really suspect. Um, as examples of an unreconstructed, my papers, as an example of unreconstructed critical approach, applying his mentoral attentions like a Zen master, he whacked me, <laughs> dubbing my writings as weird, absurd, stupid, shocking. 
And what would he have said if he had been there instead of in Austin? I don't know, but on tape. I've got it on tape. And the Wittgenstein and Merleau-Ponty paper, he wanted me to go deeper than comparing their similarities to think like them. Good criticism. <coughs> I was just trying to understand what they were saying. In the Parton paper, I said nothing about the post-critical logic of God talk, but rather resonated with the rejection of theism and search for religious meaning by Tillich, Iliada, Bella, and Jung. Bill's effort was to awaken me to see that God was made a problem by the Enlightenment's critical thinking by accrediting rationality and scientific reasoning while casting suspicion on all religious talk because not publicly verifiable. Bill affirmed, on the contrary, the contingency of, this is in the tape, the contingency of Isaiah and Jeremiah and the book of Genesis ways of talking about religion are logically of the same order as the contingency of the whole modern scientific way of talking. Here is a clue why he shifts primacy from theology to philosophy. People like myself, post-critically inclined but not awakened, cannot be persuaded of the radical personal religious claims he's making about God incarnate in each of us, as in the 1954 essay, without first showing how all claims to truth are personal and rest upon the acritical foundation of our mind bodily being in the world. If he can persuade that they are logically of the same order, then religious language such as Christ in me is true. Having established the ground for such religious talk in his three books, why then doesn't he return to develop further his theological affirmation and show us how to do post-critical theology? I don't know the answer, but I do know the question, and what are we to do about it? Okay, how can we speak religiously from our mind-body ground? Once I have recovered the ground of knowing as my mind-body, how can I speak theologically? How can I be sure that my religious speech, not publicly confirmable by reason and evidence, is true? How can I use religious speech responsibly to critical listeners who will misconstrue my meaning? What bill are the distinguishing marks of true religious first-person speech? by which to assess the truth of others and my own religious statements. Perhaps Bill is getting at this when he affirms existential intuition, where, quote, a claim cannot be, this is from Polanyi Meditation, where a claim cannot be proven by philosophical argument, its sole warrant would come from your own existential intuition, that it is this way in your own acts of owning your words, I would not underestimate the extent to which our ethos alienates us from this intuitive certainty, but I would also ask, if this is not to be trusted, how can anything be? He doesn't explain, however, what he means by existential intuition. How do we distinguish true intuitions from distortions by the deceit of ego? What is the logic and location of religious talk? While Bill does not venture forth, he has set us up with his philosophical meditations to speak confidently in the first person. Whatever held him back, shouldn't we make the attempt? Here's a go at it. Um, I'm becoming very vulnerable here, friends, and I'm trusting your Potitian generosity, <clears throat> not to mention your insight and critical acumen. Okay. Having no explanation, I would think intuition directs me to start from my mind-body ground at a level of non-cognitive awareness, the tacit dimension. For the ground of the logic of religious talk, we need to look within rather than to external things and to go even deeper than the roots of our knowing to the tacit roots of our being. If the logic of religious talk functions on the experiential level of depth in my being, can I reflect on what reality I find within my tacit dimension? Can I reflect, in Bill's words, on 
my ground in its, that's Yahweh's, ground, where no dualism can gain purchase. <clears throat> if God was in Christ means my experience of the real presence in me, then I need to descend into the tacit depths of my intuitive existence. Notice, Bill, I'm speaking as you insist in the first person singular. Polanyi speaks of this place where Bill has brought us in the following way, and you all are familiar with the quote. I believe that the function of philosophical reflection consists in bringing light and firming as my own. The beliefs implied in such of my thoughts and practices I believe to be valid that I must aim at discovering what I truly believe in and at formulating the convictions which I find myself holding. A Petitian remark. The word belief does not mean belief in a concept, but belief as trust. Commitments in his tacit dimension to realities he dwells amidst and is tacitly invested in. To do post-critical theology, I start then in the tacit dimension of my mind bodily being in the world, seeking to discover my commitments deep down in the realities I am, to invent a word, embrangled with. <laughs> One of his favorite words. This is already familiar to me as a Quaker. What Polanyi calls the tacit dimension, Petit calls mind bodily being, and Merleau-Ponty calls pre-reflective consciousness, friends call waiting attentively in silence. Deeper than the silence underlying our knowing, this silence undergirds our being in which we can become aware of the knottedness and captivities to ego, the dualistic splits in our lives, and the divine presence within, and thus the source of religious speech. A little Quaker history. George Fox, founder of the Quaker movement, articulates Friend's approach to religious truth in his challenge the first time Margaret Fell heard Fox preach. Margaret Fell, who would later become the major administrator for Quakers and still later George Fox's wife. Quote from Fox, you will say, Christ saith this and the apostles say this, but what canst thou say? So I am caught challenged and inspired by Fox's What Canst Thou Say, echoed by Polanyi's passion to discover his lived commitments, by Niebuhr's confession of inner life experience, by Pascal's reasoning of the heart, and by Bill's insistence we speak from our mind bodily ground in the first person singular. How do I speak religiously? Searching for divinity within the depths of my mind body by waiting in silence, I come upon stillness, something that feels fully real, yet is different from absence of noise and motion. In such stillness, I can experience mystery, surrounding and pervading me. Experiencing mystery is having a sense or having a feel of this strange reality. This makes my critical mind anxious and upset, because since Descartes, we have demeaned feeling as purely subjective. To speak in the first person singular, however, to think post-critically, I must take feeling seriously, as Polanyi does. In the realm of deep feeling, I experience stillness, mystery. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but just give you some other words. Presence, guidance, self-illumination, self-transformation. I understand these as my interacting in inwardness with God. As these arise in my reflective waiting in silence, I am in a position to think about what this all means in relation to the images and ideas in my Quaker and Christian traditions. Having lived, for example, with images of Jesus as filled with spirit, audaciously freed from ego, I recognize, that's not the way people normally talk about Jesus, but that's what I see of Jesus, one of the things I see. I recognize a transformative impulse within me as the presence of Christ in me. For Niebuhr, self-transformation is an ongoing imperative, the title of his autobiographical essay at the end of his life. Yet Niebuhr does not write about his own experiences of self-transformation, nor does Bill. Bill does write about what emerges from his reflections in his own interiority in his Wittgenstein style meditations and investigations. These are, however, about his recovering the ground for religious expression, not about expressing his own religious experience. What I'm doing is looking within myself and then saying what I find. Bill, I am trying in the first person singular. 
How can I know that my first person speech is true? Okay, Bill. If rational scientific statements and religious talk are on the same order, how then can I confirm the truth of such personal utterances? How can I be sure that what I say, when it is not publicly verifiable, as science is, is true and not a subjectivism shaped by my own inflated ego and contorted self? And what kind of sureness is possible to speak religiously in the first person? Bill doesn't ever just lay out the distinguishing marks. That's a phrase from Jonathan Edwards, by the way, distinguishing marks, um, who was being taught by Niebuhr at, at Yale when Bill was here as well as when I was here. But hasn't he brought us to the place where we need to think about it on our own and say what we see? From my Quaker perspective, I suggest the following as marks of true singular first person religious speech. I'm not trying to persuade you of any of these things, but trying to evoke in you your own thinking about, so how can I be sure that what I'm saying in the first person singular is true? True speech discerns the difference in my tacit depths between self-aggrandizing ego and the deeper self, which friends call spirit. But Tietz Pascal, in the dissertation, recognized that the human predicament was caused by the two inherent loves of self and God becoming conflictual with the love of self dominating and repress repressing love of God. To assess first person truth, I need to recognize my own capacity for self-deception. Truth in inwardness will always be distorted if expressed by ego because it overlooks the heart's fuller reality and deeper perspective. Reacquainting myself with feeling which modernity has demeaned and Pascal, Niebuhr, and Polanyi have sought to recover is crucial. Religious truth requires learning the feel of mystery, like the taste of honey. Um, this is an Augustine's confession somewhere, this metaphor. You come to know by the taste of it. In the feel of mystery, there is a sense of fullness in which I feel surrounded and pervaded by an encompassing whole that exceeds my comprehension. Bill's quoting St. Paul was getting at this, that in God, that in God we live and move and have our being. This is like the sense of being pregnant with creativity of a poem, insight, or scientific discovery, a whole that is pressing from below. You just feel it, and it feels real. Pilani has argued for a sense of fruitfulness felt in scientific theory as one mark of truth. Taking account of this in expressions of religious truth in our personal lives is important as well. Is there a fittingness in what I say is true? In Quaker talk, does it speak to my condition? And is it in unity with creation? That is, does it fit with or contort the deeper relatedness of my being in the world? Still working on distinguishing marks here. Does the truth I utter in personal talk about God, myself, and the world express friendship with or alienation from being? mine and the world's? Is it affection or fear through which I relate to self and world? Religious words are true if they carry a faithfulness, a trust in the whole in which I live and move and have my being. Finally, I need communal confirmation through dialogical sharing. Others confirming in their depths what I am finding within myself. Rational argument should find its proper place to clarify, connect, criticize within dialogue rather than usurping it. Since reason depends upon our tacit dialogical relatedness with all of being. In naming some distinguishing marks of first person truth, I am exemplifying how post-critical theology might work. Reflect, to use a phrase from Niebuhr, on what is going on in my tacit dimension. Think about its relation to what I am struggling with in my culture, and then begin to say what I can. What are the beliefs I find myself holding? So, what is the answer, and what questions then arise? What was Petit up to from the beginning? From his dissertation on Bill seeks freedom from critical reasons, denigration of body and first person speech. Religious and scientific talk are of the same order because both are grounded in our a critically committed bodily being in the world. 
We can, therefore, speak truth from personal depths without scientific public verification. So what are we to do about it? In his dissertation, Bill says, Pascal was inwardly poised and therefore capable of viewing human experience with unblinking candor. And what he found was that God is already <clears throat> present. Bill advocates Pascal's phenomenology of the interior religious and moral experience because he believed an access to ultimate reality was available to man's soul directly. If Bill from the beginning has sought to free us from the critical mind's constraints, we need to spring forth from where he got 50 years later. Can we embark on a dialogue of what are appropriate criteria for discerning truth in first-person speech and how we can speak responsibly to others in a critical world which prevents equilibrium between scientific and religious truth? What kind of reason establishes such equilibrium, critical or post-critical, and how so? That our knowing is by a divided self in which ego dominates heart, what are the implications in establishing the same order for post-critical moral consciousness? How does it overcome alienation from the world and transport us into feeling at home in being? Bill did not engage feminist and liberation thinkers who were embracing feeling and first-person religious speaking. What should we do? from our recovered ground. Answers will only emerge, I think, however, if we actually explore our inwardness and share what we're finding in first-person dialogue. Bill is beckoning. The ground is prepared. The calling is clear, at least for me, to say what I can. Where has Bill brought you? And what are you going to do about it?